welcome to this evening's budget workshop. Uh, there will be no public comment this evening. Um, uh, public comment uh, on these uh, budget workshop items will be, I believe, on April 5th. Is that correct, Administrator? And uh, if uh, you would like to comment, you could email public comment at lewistonmaine.gov. Um, let's proceed. If you can both introduce yourselves uh, and then please uh, proceed. Certainly, Mr. Mayor, City Council, uh, Heather Hunter, the City Administrator for the City of Lewiston. Thank you, and I'm David St. Pierre, the Chief of Police. So tonight we are beginning tonight's budget workshop, um, mostly the public safety theme tonight. So beginning on page 51, we'll be uh, talking about police first. Um, the police department did have one new program in service. Um, right now we have um, a full-time and a half-time crisis worker position. They're looking at making the half-time crisis worker position into a full-time position. Right now, it looks like that has an additional cost, about $39,000 in order to do that. The police department at a whole, as a whole increased 485,355 or 6.6%. .6%, and you will see the, the theme typically, as we saw with other departments, is going to reside in personal services but we will go in more detail, um, beginning with police admin, had an overall increase of $34,700, or 6.3%. Of that amount, that was pretty much all in personal services. Contractual services actually decreased by about $1,900. Um, it's an off year for civil service exams, so that saved about $3,200 and um, there was a small offsetting increase with um, the telephone due to the air cards that they've been using and so forth. Supplies increased by just shy of $1,800. That's all in gasoline and diesel. And then fixed charges rose by about $300. Um, that's it, the increase in liabilities, um, the police coverage costs, it, they have a, a policy, a standalone policy, which is unique to the police department versus all of the other departments. The criminal investigations division had an overall increase of $55,000 or 3.5%. Of that, $52,339 was in personal services. And that's broken down between regular wages of $47,000 and then overtime rose by about $5,100. Contractual services rose by about $1,300 and that's a um, combination of an increase in training for $1,600 um, given uh, promotions and turnover and so forth. And just like we've seen in the rest of the departments, the need to kind of get back out there and get the training going and those those elements. Supplies also rose by about $1,800. Again, that's all in gas. And they had a small decrease in dues of about $190. Flipping over to page 52, let's talk about the patrol division. That division had an increase of $374,740, or 8.5%. Personal services rose by $274,072. Of that amount, $233,000 were in regular wages, which includes the restatement of two patrol officers. Um, Chief, I don't know if you want to talk about those two positions now or wait till I should, later. I, I should okay, count. go ahead. So uh, typically we have 85 sworn police officers as our full complement. Um, the former council um, froze two positions, making it 83. Uh, so right now, full complement is 85. Um, however, we haven't been able to come near filling that at this point in time um, due to lack of interest, I think, or, or just trying to find qualified candidates that actually want to be police officers. Um, so we would be willing, of course, to, to continue with that freezing of those two positions, believing that we probably couldn't fill them if we wanted to at this point. So that may be on the proposed budget sheets for uh, adjustments once we get all the department workshops for your consideration and then we can kind of either evaluate it or discuss it a little bit more at that point in time. The last part of the increase in personal services represents a 
$51,000 increase in overtime. Contractual services rose by $57,000. We had an increase of just shy of $11,000 in repairs to vehicles due to actual costs and part increases and, and so forth. Miscellaneous services increased by $21,000. That's the contract for the crisis workers. Um, we need to kind of vet that number a little bit more now that we've had some updated information. So there may be some tweaking of that number once the adjustments are proposed as well. And then in-service training rose by $25,250 and that included an anticipated six new officers at the academy and, and getting them up and running and ready to um, patrol. Supplies rose by $43,000, um, a little over about $43,600, and 40 of that is in gasoline. And we also include or anticipate an increase of department apparel of $7,750. That relates to the new officers that we're anticipating. We also had a small reduction here of about $4,500. We did move some um, uh, shotguns over to fund balance be given their useful life it, it did qualify so that allowed us a small savings in uh, public safety supplies all of the con capital outlay for the vehicles were moved to the fund balance but it did include three police cruisers three um, mid-size SUVs and a full-size SUV and the accessories associated with that the support division, which is on the bottom of page 52 and continues to 53, had an overall increase of $14,694, or 2.2%. Of that amount, $10,000 represents um, increases in personal services. We had a contractual increase of $4,373. That's in maintenance and licensing. That includes um, general price increases, for IMC and other software used by the police department. Supplies and fixed costs were flat for this year's budget. The police building um, was relatively flat as well overall. It had about a $3,700 increase or about 3%. $1,800 was from personal services. Those are cross-charge. Um, support fees charged by public works building workers to the police department. You had something similar with the library. Um, and then the balance, the $2,000 balance increase was all in utilities for about $2,900. The animal control officer rose by about $2,300 or 2.2% of which $1,400 is in personal services. Um, we contract with the um, Humane Society and they have um, been flat for a number of years for the services that they provide the city. I think it's probably going on maybe eight to ten years they have not raised their prices so it's, they, they have a good track record with their endowments and their um, fundraising and so forth. Supplies rose about $850, that's all in gasoline. So that's the police department on the general fund component. The next page is the police drug forfeiture account. Um, you might remember, um, and typically, depending on what it is, they typically fall under the consent agenda item, accepting drug forfeitures for varying amounts. That What you're accepting turns around and pays for this fund. This is a special revenue fund. It is not part of general fund. Changes to this fund do not impact the tax rate unless we move something from general fund over to this fund. There's no um, tax rate involved with that. Both of the, there's a federal portion and a state portion of drug forfeitures and they have very specific guidelines of what can be charged there. So we have to meet those guidelines in order to utilize this fund for those various charges. So right now you will see, um, it's so funny, at, at the preparation of this document, we kept hearing about this 
huge drug forfeiture we were supposed to do. And I'm writing up my notes and yesterday, Dave, what did we get? <laughs> we got part of a, a, of a substantial payment that we're gonna be getting, so $454,000, so that certainly helps. So you will notice I was getting ready to say we have to be careful of what's charged because you will notice on page uh, 54 that the balance there was about $41,000 and you can see how that steadily declined over the years. And then lo and behold, timing is everything and, and we finally got that forfeiture. So that allows us to kind of feel very secure about the, what we're requesting from this budget and to move forward with that. So personal services is not able to be charged here unless it's an overtime drug related component. Regular wages cannot be funded through this. Um, looking at overall contractual services, we have a decrease of about $17,000. And that's made up of decreases in in-service training that um, we've either moved or completed for this year um, and uh, testing services. <coughs> Likewise, the, what we're charging for supplies have also decreased by about $17,382. Um, we had some offsetting increases and decreases here. So other supplies rose by $1,500. That represents accessories, drone equipment, and program supplies related to the drone. And that's offset by a decrease in public safety supplies. Some of those items were moved to general fund and you, we just talked about the increase on the general fund side of things. That may be with this money that we receive, we may be able to look at seeing if any of those increased on the general fund side can now be moved to this now that we know we actually have the cash involved. And then we had a decrease of $6,000 in capital. Um, that's based upon the new vehicle accessories. Um, again, recognizing we were drawing this balance down, we moved a lot of that back to general fund. That may be something we can move back here in order to um, kind of normalize the tax rate on the general fund side. Um, so you mentioned that there, were, there are two patrol positions frozen right now. Correct. Um, so you have a full complement of 83. How many patrol positions are filled right now? Uh, right now we're 10 officers short at this okay. point in time, exactly. And that's due to retirements, uh, recent retirements. Uh, we have one that's waiting to go to the academy that should be going the next time around, coming up in August. We have one at the academy. So they're not all useful. We have one in the military, and of course we, we have to hold it, that, that job and keep him actively employed. Um, I'm wondering if, if it doesn't look like those are all going to be filled in this next budget cycle, would it make any sense to freeze a couple more and then bring them back later? Uh, I, don't, I just don't know for well, sure. Well, I think we need 85, and it would be much right. better to have 85. There are times that we certainly can't uh, meet our staffing challenges. Um, right. Our Crow team right now is going on two people, a sergeant and one officer, where it's usually a sergeant and three officers. We usually have up to three other people in a selective enforcement team to strategically take care of any problems that might come, whether that be speeding, drugs, prostitution, you name it, the gamut, whatever the, the problem of the day is or the perceived problem by the community, that team would address that. So we're going short on, on many things right now, um, so coverage is short. So I, I wouldn't want to cut okay. beyond that. Hopefully you'll be able to, to fill okay. some of those. Thank you. Councillor Peace. Yeah, back on the same subject. Um, I know you're too short. You mentioned there were 16 potential officers at the academy right now. 16? Yeah. We uh, have one there right now at the well, academy. We have one. Didn't you say we were paying for 16 or something? Oh, the estimated six new hires throughout the next fiscal year. Oh, okay. Yes. Well, I was it's a okay. little, <laughs> little confusing. Uh, now, can I go to a different, other than police? A different division? Well, I was thinking about what you said about the Humane Society. Yep, that's part they of it, please. They haven't raised anything for 18 years. It's been a number of years, yes. I can, I'm sorry? 
yes, I, that's how I thought. I said seven or eight. Oh, even seven or eight. Uh, is there any way in the budget we can find like a donation that we can make to them? I think they're self-supporting on their donations that they don't need to raise the rate. That's a good thing for the city. Yeah, it is. So they are able through fundraisers. I know they have done a number of grant con uh, contests or competitive grant processes where you kind of email in and keep voting and voting and voting. I, they got one, I think it was two years ago, that was pretty substantial um, through that mechanism. So um, at this point, they don't need to raise the rates. They're able to, to balance their budget. Okay, that's but, great because I was wondering if, what their budget was and you know, yeah. they were doing it because of the city. And, nope. Uh, oh, great. They, they're able to do that, so that's a good thing. Yeah, thank you. Councilor McCarthy. Uh, I think what Larry was referring to is didn't one of the meetings we had, you said, or someone said that there are limits to the number of people we can send to the academy at any one time because of uh, limitations there? <clears throat> right. It, it has been challenging, obviously, like everything else in the world with COVID, um, having, you know, they actually closed the academy several times and did not hold a class. So now they're catching up. Um, we have one that's on standby right now. He was number 71. If one person dropped out, he would have been in. So we were unfortunate that he wasn't able to get in. Uh, we do, we, and we're constantly searching and going to the job fairs and such. We have one uh, potential hire coming who's actually doing his training. He's a police officer in Pittsburgh, New, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So he's a blue pin, what's referred to as a blue pin. So he won't have to go to the academy. So these are some of the things that we're looking at is people that are already trained so that we don't have to send them to the academy and wait. Um, I think things are starting to alleviate considerably at the academy from my understanding and talking to, to other law enforcement officers, other chiefs and such, um, that you know we're, we're getting back to normalcy here. Same with the courts, same with with everything and it's going to take a little bit of time you know to be completely normal but we still have to have the people on standby waiting to go that we've already hired um, the academy chooses or selects the cadets to go to the academy if you will by their hire date um, that's one of the big components in their deciding factor if we hire somebody you know two months ago and maybe lisbon pd hires one one month ago we would get preference over lisbon because we had the hire date prior to their them so you can hire them before they go to the academy and then we send them to the academy? Right. And what's been happening, and it's unfortunate, and we give them, you know, uh, duties to do and perform while they're here, but the one that's currently with us that's not at the academy has been with us, um, well, come August, it's going to be 11 months. Oh and so he, he's not able to perform the regular law enforcement functions because we're accredited and we cannot have them working in a full-time capacity as a law enforcement officer. There's too much liability. For the city okay well how long is the training take at the academy what's the cycle it's 18 weeks 18 weeks following a, um, a field training program after that which is three months long at least three months oh, long. Wow. so it's a long haul to get someone hired we just got um, four of our officers or three out of the four off of their field training right now and one of them is due to come off soon as well so we should have four more officers working on their own which will certainly help us help and reduce the overtime and, and such. Thank you. Further questions from the council? Anything else? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank so you very much. Next we'll okay. move on Thank to you. fire and bring Chief Karen up. Thank you, Chief. Chief, if you could please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Mark Karen. I'm the fire chief. So the fire department begins on page 55. Um, there was one request as a new program and service from the fire department, and it's been on the list for at least a couple years, if not three years now, on the as a, a, an assistant chief. Um, it's got a total pricing of $137,000. That does not include the vehicle associated with that. Looking at the entire firefighting budget, um, they have an overall increase of 579,000 or essentially 580,000 or a 7.7% increase. 
fire admin, which is on page 55, had an increase of $22,880, or 7.3%. Uh, of that amount, $20,000 was in personal services. Contractual services rose by $2,150. Um, that's comprised of an increase in telephone based upon usage and CBAs, as well as repairs to vehicles um, of $1,100. Both the chief, chief and the assistant chief's vehicles um, need some rust repair in order to, to maintain them. So that's program in the current year budget. Got a small increase in supplies of about $300 and that includes the gasoline. And then the fixed charges were flat. The firefighting budget, which is at the bottom of page 55 and continues to page 56 has an overall increase of $508,000 or 7.5%. Personal services rose by $366,000. Of that regular time, rose by $13,822. Um, right now, the, or for FY23, the, the fire unit does not have a settled collective bargaining agreement, so the regular wages is low compared to other departments because um, that's not a finalized or a settled contract. The amount that is increasing reflects the step increases that are programmed already in the contract. Leaving an increase in overtime of $352,570. The contractual side of the budget increased by $14,574. We have um, small increases in medical services of about $2,000. Um, there are a number of tests that the firefighters have to, to do and get TB test and so forth. For whatever reason, that TB test has increased steadily for the last several years and that's the, the driving cost behind the increase in this particular line item. We have a $2,100 increase in repairs to vehicle based upon anticipated repairs, particularly with engine three and ladder one. And then in-service training of $10,350. That is um, for leadership training as well as some various fire rescue training within the department. That was part of the um, Fire study um, talked about training and leadership and so forth, so they are now starting to prog that, program that within the budget. Supplies rose by $41,776, of which $12,000 was an increase in gasoline and diesel. We had department and individual apparel increase by $21,651. Um, there's an estimate to have seven new firefighters program within this budget, so that's the other reason you have a lot of training and a lot of um, department and individual apparel. Public safety supplies rose by $7,700, and again, that's for increase in cost of hoses and accessories, nozzles, valves, and so on and so forth. The fixed costs rose by $85,500. That represents the hydrant rental, and it's kind of a misnomer in the titling. That's the building of the water system to enable the fire department to effectively fight fires. So when last year's 23% water rate increase went into effect, that's phased in. So last year, the first quarter was at the old rate and the other three quarters were at the 23% increased rate. This reflects that last quarter being at the higher rate. So now this is the full year of that um, hydrant rental charge that the water department charges the fire department for that service. Looking at fire communication on page 56, had an overall increase of about $5,400, or 7.1%. Bulk of that is in personal services at $3,300. The balance falls in contractual services, and that's split between an increase in in-service training at $1,400, 
as well as some other minor fluctuations in the other account. Fire prevention, again, is on the bottom of page 56 and continues to the top of page 57. Had an increase of $566, or 0.3%. So they had some fluctuations between accounts for that net income, or net impact of the $566. So decreases in personal services due to turnover, offset by increases in contractual, particularly in training. The fire stations, it's on the bottom of page 57, had an overall increase of just shy of $43,000 or 42.3%. It's pretty much all in contractual services. They had an increase in utilities of about $6,900. Um, it's not only did you have the increase in utility costs, but this is probably the first full year that the new North Temple Fire Station is online. That's a bigger building. There's some additional cost and so forth. Um, likewise, in fuel supplies, that increased by $12,112. Outside rental increased by $7,500. That's snow removal for the new station. Um, we're contracting that out to a private plower, so that's the cost of plowing that new station. We have repairs to buildings of 50, uh, I'm sorry, okay, of just shy of $16,000. Um, as we saw in other buildings, we are looking at taking the fire stations online with the HVAC preventive maintenance. So that's the bulk of that increase. Then we have a small increase in supplies of about $550 in household supplies. That's just general <coughs> price increases for supplies that they need. As within all the other departments, capital is funded through fund balance. They have requests for various public safety equipment, including some thermal Im imagers and um, furniture and fixtures, bedding, appliance replacement, things like that. It also includes, as most of you did the um, training for uh, FEMA at the Central Fire Station, it was a little rough when we took a tour. Um, so that includes some um, painting at the uh, Central Fire Station as well as flooring replacement there too. So that's pretty much everything there is to the fire budget. Councilor Pease. Yes, that tour was a little shocking. Um, <laughs> and you desperately need new furniture there. There's no question there. <laughs> Have you moved the exercise room over and changed that over yet, or are you waiting? Uh, we're currently doing that now. You're doing it now. Yeah, because that other room's way too small to begin with. Right. So we'll keep up the good work, and I, I think we'd like to have another tour when you're done. Sure, I'll let you know. Thank you. Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, so just a quick, just for clarification, just because I wanted to make sure I heard you correctly, for the new assistant chief, that include that that cost of one thirty seven five zero three includes the vehicle. Excludes the vehicle. Excludes the vehicle. Yes. Okay. Can we put that on the list, please? Sure. Thank you. Ah. Councilor La Chapelle. Um, I had the pleasure of speaking with the chief earlier this week, and one of my questions was overtime. Uh, and. I'd like to address that at some point on how we eliminate that much overtime. Um, if it's possible, how we can get around to it. Um, that's killing the budget for both departments, police and fire. You see, you group that together, I believe, in a, in a, you gave us a breakdown. Right. And I can't remember what page that's on. It, yeah, it's way at the beginning. So, if you look on page 22. So, halfway down the page, 4212, that's the CID division of police. So, they had um, 
$76,000. That's, that's the recommended amount. So they had a 7.2% increase. Um, the patrol division had about a 10% increase. And then the firefighters, which is the 4222, had the 37% increase. So CID's overtime increase was 5,000. 120 patrols was 51,000 and firefighting was 352,570 those were the increases of those three but departments. we're still budgeting for 1.3 million dollars mm -hmm. in overtime correct correct for the fire department we are looking at yep on page uh, 55, just so everybody understands where the counselor got that. Under firefighting, the second line, right-hand column, that's where he's pulling that number. I'd just like to talk about that later on. Yep, I, I put it on the list, thank you. Further questions from the council? Chief, thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks. So now I will bring up our new 911 director, Tim Hall, to join me and talk about 911, which is on page 76. Plus, you are also sent um, some supplementary information regarding 911 that includes Director Hall's. Um, explanations of fluctuations within the budget and so on and so forth. Hi, I'm Tim Hall, the director for Lewiston Auburn 911. So the 911 budget, the overall increase was $63,734 or 5.5%. Um, of that amount, 54701 represents increases in personal services are 2.39%. And that's based upon a full complement of employees like 911. Um, our 911 is very similar to the police officers. They've had some issues with vacancies and, and so forth. So this budget includes, um, I'm gonna get the, is it, it's not the lobster. The modified lobster. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let, the director kind of explained how that piece works, but that is included in this year's budget, which is representing that increase. So uh, back when I began with the 911 Center in 2009, we had an authorized 22 positions within the dispatch center. Back in 2017, I believe it was, we froze one of those positions and then ultimately eliminated uh, second position, bringing us down to a total of 20, which is where we stand today. In this budget, I am requesting to restore funding for one of those positions for half the year. Uh, just, in, just since 2007, our 911 call volume has increased 54%. Uh, we are one of the busiest, in fact, we're the fourth busiest 911 center in the state of Maine. Uh, there are dispatch centers in the state of Maine that have far less calls than us and have far more dispatchers on duty to handle those calls than us. Uh, additionally, since, uh, with the, or since the elimination of those positions or around the same time, we uh, took on some additional responsibilities at the 911 Center. So we also have a contractual arrangement with the town of Poland to dispatch their fire and rescue department. We also answered their 911 calls for the town of Poland they also provide EMS transport services to the town of Mechanic Falls during the daytime hours for 12 hours a day. Uh, and we're responsible to manage those calls and dispatch the EMS units for those calls. The Auburn Fire Department has since added two EMS transport units as well. Those used to be handled by United Ambulance and Auburn back in 2014 added two ambulances. So we are now responsible for dispatching those. Prior to my time at 911, the original arrangement, or my understanding of the original arrangement for
for Lewiston Medical Calls was that we would receive the 911 call, but then we would transfer that 911 call directly to United Ambulance, and they would perform all of the emergency medical dispatch questions and dispatching of the medical calls. That has not occurred since I've come to 911, uh, again, back in 2009. Uh, we answer those 911 calls. We are the ones responsible for the questions that we ask of the caller, and simultaneously, we are on the telephone with United Ambulance, uh, giving them that information. So it's a, it's a pretty labor-intensive process all around. Um, our, our dispatchers are great. They're very good at multitasking, but there is only so much you can ask one person to do. We continue to add duties to them at a time that we continually shrink their ranks, essentially. So my hope is to restore uh, the funding for at least one of the frozen positions for at least half the year. That helps to kind of uh, not have the cost all at one time. And then in future years, I would look to increase staffing even beyond that. My ultimate goal would be to have six dispatchers on duty during our peak call volume times, typically during the day and the evening hours when we see the highest amount of calls to allow for us to provide a better service, not just to our departments, but also to the public. Excuse me. Um, you said you would like to put a half half a year. How much difference in cost would it be to keep the person a full year? Well, essentially, what we're uh, trying to do is implement this new position to start January one of two thousand twenty-three. If we were to say start them in July one, uh, you're essentially going to double the cost increase in our FY twenty-three budget. Uh, but the other piece of that is the reality of could I find a person to get into that position by July 1st? Oh, okay. And quite frankly, I don't think I could. We have three current vacancies uh, at our center now. We have one person scheduled to start next week, and we have a person in the background process now, so hopefully that'll be a second person. So even not starting until January, I would still have another position to fill ahead of that. I think that's more reasonable of a timeline for us. And much like the uh, police and fire departments, mm -hmm. it's not a matter of finding somebody that we can hire and have them start tomorrow. There's four weeks worth of training at the Criminal Justice Academy they have to go to, and then there's approximately four months of field training that takes place in the center itself before they can start taking calls on their own. So it's a long process. Thank you. I understand that you're shot-handed, and it's, it's a shame that we can't find these people. Yeah, it's difficult. And I don't know if it's because there's lack of the type or if it's lack of pay. I, I mean, I, I certainly, everybody would always say pay, uh, and I, th I think it plays a role. When I search around even other 911 centers in the state of Maine, uh, we're not the lowest starting wage, but we're close to the lowest. Um, so I think there's a factor of wage, but a lot of it, what we find time and time again, that people depart our facility, it, they don't cite money, they cite schedule. Uh, we're a 24-7 operation, of course. It means working weekends, nights, holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all those things. And initially, the first couple of years, that's okay with people, but, you know, after 10 years of doing that, you tire of it. And it's a stressful job nationally, the, the burnout rate. Uh, I think it's something like 60% of people burn out in the first five years of their career and just can't do it anymore. So yeah. it's, it's just a struggle. I'm sure it's dramatic. It's, it, yeah. it certainly can be. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay, so. Oh, okay. Councilor McCarthy. Quick question. What do you run for a, uh, a schedule as far as, do they work in eight hour shifts, 12 hour shifts? Sure, they work eight hour shifts. Uh, four days on followed by two days off, so their days off are always rotating around, but they're assigned either to days, evenings, or overnights, so their actual shift hours stay the same. Uh, and they are eight-hour shifts, but uh, we need to fill the seat 24-7, so that can be as long as 16 hours if somebody's taking a day off or yeah. if we're short people. Uh, sounds like fun. <laughs> yeah. If I can uh, respectfully ask counselors to hold questions until the end of the presentation. Please proceed. 
Certainly. So um, that kind of provides the explanation for the increase in personal services. Contractual services rose by um, just a little over $16,000, our 9.65%. Um, utilities and telephones grouped together had an overall $10,255. Um, again, attributed to not only general increases, but um, with the new radio systems, we have two tower buildings that we are now having to power and, and provide telephone lines and so forth to. Maintenance and licensing also, as you see with the city side, 911 also has a number of softwares that they use. That had an increase of $6,400. Training rose by uh, $3,700, and then we had a small, um, or the one sold decrease of magnitude was in mileage of about $5,000. It was an off year for the CLEAR accreditation program, so that provided some relief to the other increases. Supplies remain relatively flat as, as well as fixed charges. Um, debt service, we no longer, um, with the radio project, given the magnitude of the project and the cost, um, there is no debt service funded at 911 that we split. Um, both the City of Auburn and City of Lewiston agreed at the time that each would incur their own debt on that radio project because it was such a large project. So that debt service is being paid and included within both cities' operating budgets. Capital outlay increased by $8,300, and that's all in communication equipment, which includes computers, uh, monitors, and, and various keyboard stations, those types of things. Again, with a 24 operation, heavily reliant on technology, they tend to burn through some of those accessories pretty quickly. And as the director mentioned, um, we do provide services for the town of Poland. We do um, do some support for Androscoggin County and so forth. So we have um, MOUs, uh, uh, agreements with both of those that have escalators in there. So our revenues for both of those increased by about $1,000 a piece. Um, that was offset by a decrease in interest based upon the current rate environment right now. Um, we are looking at um, 911 has a same or similar fund balance policy that the city has, but theirs is a, a floor of 6% and a ceiling of 10%. So there, where ours is that 10% sweep spot, 911's typically is about 8%. So they usually get to the year end and we do a snapshot based upon the projected fund balance and anything at that point in time. Uh, the committee approves capital outlay, so there was a number of repairs and one-time cost um, that was put through there. And then he's looking at using $25,000 to balance the FY23 budget in order to kind of pay down uh, both municipalities' contributions to that. So between the two, um, that decreased by $50,000 for last year but we're able to pay for a number of improvements at the 911 center that are not included in the operating budget, so there's a trade-off there. Right now, the current coverage with the $25,000 backed out of that is at 10.15, so there is some room there. It also allows the um, 911 center and the board to kind of carry through with funding capital outlay with that fund balance similar to the general funds policy. And that would conclude the 911 presentation. How many years have you served as director? I actually I just began. I started in January. So. Okay. Right. <laughs> but he's been with the 911 center for a number of months. Uh, years. Years. Now. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. That that clears it. So when did you start? I started with this center in 2009. Okay, that clears up confusion for me. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Councilor La Chapelle. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do we track where the calls come from? Uh, it's a tricky question. Uh, the easy answer is yes. Uh, the more convoluted answer is not really. Uh, for example, my 911 center, so we have two different 
two different phone systems. One is a 911 system provided to us by the state, which of course handles 911 calls. Uh, then we have a non-emergency telephone system, which handles all those other non-emergency calls that we handle for all of our agencies. And actually our non-emergency calls, uh, those are well over 100,000 a year. Our emergency calls are just over 47,000 calls this last year. So on the 911 side, I, I can run a report that tells me uh, the number of calls coming from a community. It's somewhat uh, misleading in some cases because, for example, Lewiston may show a high number of 911 calls coming from Lewiston, and they might be coming from the hospital, and it's doctors calling for ambulances for their patient who lives in Portland mm -hmm. or lives in Poland or lives in Oxford. So it's not really a, yes, it's a 911 call we're answering, but we're transferring that call to another agency to process. So it's not necessarily creating a large workload on us. And the same would be true for the other communities that we serve. Thank you. Yes. Councilor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Director, uh, when you said something, it kind of threw me for a loop there for a second. The state handles the initial E911 call and then hands it off to us or? They do not. The 911 calls directly to us. The, the equipment uh, to handle those 911 calls is provided to us from the state. Okay. It's like a neighboring state where I work. There's one right. PSAP that handles Perfect. and then hands everything off. Right. So, yep. We do not have that set up. Uh, quite frankly, I'm thankful for it. Uh, it means less transfer of calls and less opportunity for error. Exactly. Thank you. You mentioned uh, emergency and non-emergency calls. The non-emergency calls were approximately 100,000. Yeah, give or take, I would say just over that. Uh, I, I guess forgive my uh, confusion or ignorance, but what would be a non-emergency call? Uh, anything from uh, the neighbor's dog is barking to I locked my keys in my car. To, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, anything like that. Any Anytime you think of somebody saying, well, I'm going to call the police department, they're not calling the police department, they're calling us. We're the ones that receive those calls first, so, and then get them out to the police or the fire departments. And do we define emergency as life-threatening? Uh, I certainly would, but quite frankly, uh, that's up to the public to define, and they can define it in all sorts of ways. Uh, to one person's emergency certainly wouldn't be mine, but that's not up to me to judge. So uh, we, get we get calls on our 911 system, uh, that I would not classify as emergencies, but to that person, it probably is, or would have an urgent nature to it. Thank you. Councilor LaChapelle. Yes, question for the administrator. Uh, do we have a way to start tracking, this is including fire, police, 911, the sharing with other departments? How many times we go to Sabatis, how many times Sabatis comes to Lewiston? What's, is there a percentage or um, for, uh, for the mutual aid, mutual aid component, okay. all, all the way around. Um, I would have to check to see if each department has a mechanism. My guess is it's not something that's formally tracked, but it's something that we can look into. Because we're hearing stuff yes. that somebody's always in this town and and I just wanted to see if there's any concrete numbers, hence my question, where, mm -hmm. where's the call volume coming from? What is that looking like? Uh, so I guess I'm gonna switch back and forth. When you dispatch somebody, okay, I guess, so if it comes a non-emergency, non you just send it over to Lewiston Police Department and they pick it up and they... No, no. We, we would manage that call still. You'd still manage so, that call? Correct. So even on the non-emergency, you're managing that call. Correct. And you have no way of tracking how many calls to the non-emergency number, you know, 30,000 of them come from Lewiston, 180,000. No, the, so the easiest way probably to, to drill down to that would be instead of relying on our phone systems would be to rely on our computer-aided dispatch system. So anytime we receive a call, whether it's 911 or non-emergency or even a radio transmission from the fire department or the police department, we create what we call a call for service. So that's probably the easiest way to get to that number. Uh, a call for service would be generated, say, for a traffic stop or for an animal complaint or that type of thing. And we can run reports on those, but uh, 
our record system's pretty old, so it doesn't always give us great data, but it would certainly be a place to start. I'd like to follow up with that at some point, put it on the... I mean, I think it, it would be a great tool for the 911 committee to look at because you have all, both police fire chiefs serve on that as well as 911. So it would be a great discussion to be had at that level and, and kind of look into why everybody's there. Um, that, yeah, but, that's what I was suggesting. Okay, that's thank excellent. you. Uh, uh, who, who is the council rep on 911? Councilor Clinton. Okay. Further questions uh, from the council? Councilor McCarthy. So this is uh, 911 for just Lewis and Auburn, correct? We are primarily for Lewis and Auburn, and then we have a contractual agreement with the town of Poland. Okay. And Andrews Cargan County has their own? Correct. Separate entity. The reason why? <laughs> <laughs> is it a political reason? I'm sure that some of it is, uh, but there there's certainly financial implications uh, to combining them. Uh, there are, you know, a smaller town may not want to pay a larger share of the cost for 911. Um, but we perform to a degree, although uh, you may think a 911 center is a 911 center. Uh, we perform to a degree uh, differently. Uh, for example, the uh, city 911 center is going to be dealing with higher levels of uh, time life critical events versus a rural 911 center is going to be dealing with. So we do have s different levels of expertise, I would say. How does it, how does this, the 911 system differentiate between Lost and Auburn and outside areas? That is all technology, uh, wonderful technology. Basically, uh, almost all of our 911 calls now are cell phones. Uh, there's not many landlines left, it's all cell phones, but it's through triangulation of the cell phone towers that tells it where to send the calls. Uh, and, I, and I will say also to that point with the county 911 center, uh, we actually share a lot of technology with them, our computer-aided dispatch system that we have in place and records management for all of our agencies. That's a shared program between us and the county. Uh, the 911 system, it's a state-provided 911 phone system. Mm -hmm. uh, so the county has the same one that we have. So we actually have backup arrangements with each other so that if our building catches fire, uh, the last thing you want to do is lose 911. We can actually pick up our operations and temporarily move over to the county center and vice versa. Uh, that's something pretty critical to have in place, and uh, we've been able to achieve that over the last probably five or six years where it's really come together nice. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Director, uh, if I could, um, how many 911 centers are Kalia accredited? Uh, none in Maine other than us. We are the only one. <laughs> uh, one quick question. You mentioned there are three um, busier centers than us. Uh, which ones are they? Department of Public Safety in Augusta, which w would be more familiar to you as the State Police okay. Center, the State Dispatch Center, Penobscot County, okay, uh, and the City of Portland. They dispatch for Portland. They have a similar arrangement to Lewis and Auburn, where it's Portland, South Portland, and then they have a contract with Cape Elizabeth. Gotcha. Thank you, Councillor Pease. You stand. <laughs> Madam Administrator. Yes. You stated that we have a couple of towers now that we have to take care of? Yes, with the new radio tower system that we installed. And okay. that's about as technically knowledgeable as I am, <laughs> so I will hand that off to the director. And I know our 911 IT manager is also in the audience, so. Yeah, and I will actually do the same thing that <laughs> Administrator Hunter did, and I will hand it off to our IT director, uh, Drew McKinley, who's with us, if he would like to. Can you do these? Yeah. Please introduce yourself, sir. Sure. Sorry. My name is Drew McKinley. I'm the IT director for Lewiston Auburn 911. Please tell us about the towers. Sure. Um, <laughs> so the new, the new radio system that we implemented uh, or in the middle of implementing uh, uses four towers within uh, the two cities, two in Auburn, two in Lewiston. Um, each tower 
sends and receives radio traffic um, to all the entities that require it. So um, in the past, we still had four towers. They were in just different locations, um, but some of them were receive towers only. They did not send and receive. So with the new radio system, there's newer technology, more equipment. So that's why the power increase is there's more equipment required for those, unit, those places. Okay, thank you. Councillor Clement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the administrator stole my thunder for a moment. We do have- <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> clear accreditation, but you mentioned one in Maine, but there's only, what, three total in New England, I believe? I believe that is correct. Uh, there, are, there are others, uh, I would say southern, in the southern US. Uh, not, many. Really popul not, popular, many not many. Not many, but not many. It's and very few. Lewiston Auburn was the first in New England. Correct. And it's been that way for how many years now? Double digits? Correct. Like, like our police department, 25 years and yes. growing. Yes. Thank you. Further questions from the council? Thank you very much, Director. Thank you all. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you, IT Director. Thank you, Drew. So now we will move on to page 39, the tax income financing fund. I was going to say, is, is Lincoln joining? <laughs> I'm just a little slower than I used to Okay, be. see, I need that mirror up there. Use those cat like reflexes. <laughs> For our audience at home, please introduce yourself, sir. I am Lincoln Jeffers, Director of Economic and Community Development for the city. So this is another one similar to the Rec Activity Funds and similar to the Drug Forfeiture Fund. This is independent of the general fund, independent of the tax rate. It's um, funds set aside related to certain tax increment agreements with various projects allow us to shelter those taxes and fund economic development and, and other um, allowable costs under this. This fund is primarily um, supported with the personal property uh, agreement from the Walmart TIF as well as a smaller amount but personal property with the Argo um, TIF. So we run about, between the two, we run about um, just shy of $400,000 in revenue and personal property on those. So the revenues in this particular case are highly contingent, contingent upon what the tax rate ends up being. So obviously it, it's a matter of tax rate times assessed value and that's what will give us our revenues. Um, personal services on this fund actually decreased by $23,000. So if you will look at the balance, even though um, it's kind of all over the place funding wise. We wanna make sure that there's enough money in perpetuity to kind of keep going so we don't have to bring all of these costs onto general fund all at once. So as um, the funds slowly started depleting a few years ago, we elected to not charge all the fringe benefits um, of the employees that are funded through this fund at, to this fund. We kept some on general fund. This year, we, and you will notice on page 40, you have the proration of employees that are charged here and what percentage. You will see a couple blank spots in the department requested and recommended. We are changing some allocations. So again, we're kind of conserving some of those funds as until new program TIFs come on to make sure this, there's funding available to last and a little bit more perpetuity with that. So that decrease of impersonal services of $23,000 reflects some of that reallocation of those employees back to the general fund. And with that, their percentage-based fringe benefits all, all also decreased as well. Um, when you're looking at contractual services, that remained relatively flat. They had a decrease in ma uh, mileage and travel of about $2,000. Um, and then they uh, looked at increasing our, our funding the Top Gun program, and that's through the chamber, correct? It is run by the chamber, yeah, yes. For $1,500. Supplies remain flat. 
fixed costs in this particular case is um, comprised of debt service as well as the credit enhancements. Debt service on this particular fund refer, refer, represents infrastructure improvements related to the TIF development. So when you're talking the Walmart TIF, we had a lot of um, infrastructure needs out there. This fund would pay for that debt service. So that debt service obviously is getting paid off. So you will see annual decreases, not only with interest, but also some of the principal is starting to get paid off as, uh, in a, a faster pace with that. Likewise, we have what's known as credit enhancements. That's when, when you're approving a debt service, or I'm sorry, a credit, or a TIF agreement, my apologies, you are asking for whether it's a 35% TIF or a 40% TIF or 25%, that percentage is what percentage of the taxes that they're paying that we're going to return back to them. So again, that line item is heavily contingent about on what the final tax rate is. So um, we have kind of a snapshot here at an estimation. The donation line items represent a contribution to LA Arts. And I think Jim, okay, Jim's with me. So um, we'll bring him up here in a few minutes. Um, you received a supplemental supporting information from LA Arts that included his narrative as well as his budget. And this year's budget, because they are relocating, they have asked for an additional $5,000 as part of their operating budget. So we are going from $30,000 to $35,000. That is programmed into the, the budget as you currently see it. Um, the piece that is not currently in the budget is the $10,000 that um, they are requesting for concerts in the park. That was an amount that was funded through fund balance by the previous council kind of to kickstart the art walks again and get the public attraction to that. That is an amount that they cannot afford to continue on their own, so they are asking for an additional 10,000 to keep that program um, moving forward. So at that point, like I said, that's not in the current budget right now. If that's something the council wants to consider, I can put that on the list. Okay. So looking at the LA Arts budget, they have a net increase of $38,000. That's primarily through governmental sources. It looks like the city of Auburn is going to contribute a little bit more this year than they have in the past. So um, between the two pieces and the additional $10,000, that, that incremental increase makes up the bulk of their increase in revenues. Expenses rose by about $86,100. It includes employee expenses of $28,000. They're converting a part-time employee to a full-time position, um, especially with their new location. It has the, the venue and the um, expertise to really draw in a number of people throughout the uh, week. It includes an increase in non-employee expenses of $35,240. Most of the time that is made up of performers and, and bands and, and musicians and so forth. Um, and then they have items related to the move that is highlighted in your um, memo here. You'll see two jumps, one's in office expense and the other one's in occupancy costs. Between the two, that's an additional $18,600 that, that they're looking at increases with their new location. The bulk of that represents the increase in rent. Um, let's see if I have that here real quick. Yes, it went from 15840 to about $24,000 a year in their new location. And I'm sure the chairman of the board of LA Arts, who is with us tonight, if there's any specific questions that he'd be happy to address those. Uh, 
Dr. Perichelis, can you please join us at the table? You can come on up. How are you? Very good, thanks. Good evening. Please introduce yourself. Sure. I'm Jim Parakilis. I'm chair of the board of LA Arts, which is the arts agency of the cities of Lewiston and Auburn. Did I see in the memo that, uh, yes, and I believe um, Administrator Hunter mentioned we're uh, uh, converting the part-time uh, manager position, director position to, to full-time? Yes, that's right. Have we started a search for that? We haven't. Um, we have a search committee and we're uh, working up a, a job description um, and um, we're uh, very hopeful that both Lewiston and Auburn will provide us with the grants that we need in order to follow through with that search. Questions from the council? Councillor Pease. I notice you're looking to Auburn to get uh, $30,000 from them on, that, on their share. Mm -hmm. uh, you haven't heard back from, uh, from them yet. Um, yes, uh, Phil Kroll has, has put a request for 30000 into his budget request. Okay, so you haven't heard yet. So what, what ha what's going to happen if, if you don't get the Auburn share? Um, we haven't quite, that bridge yet. <laughs> quite, quite figured that out before. I mean, it, it is possible that we could um, hire just another half-time person um, in the administrator role. Yeah, I just think it's uh, scary when you need money to hire somebody and you're relying on other towns to help. Uh, this leaves you in a tough spot. If it yeah, yes, it does. I mean, we, we have... Um, uh, enough resources saved up that we could uh, get started uh, with with a new person, so we can we can make a hire. But um, I mean, one of the challenges of running an arts organization is that there are lots of foundations and individuals and businesses that love to support something specific that you're doing, and in fact, your biggest expenses are um, rent and and salary, especially salary. Um, and so uh, we're very dependent on the cities uh, to provide that unrestricted funding. Well, I think it's a great thing. We should keep it up. Thanks. Further questions? Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, so first off, thank you for the work that you do. I love the art walk. I go to every single one and I, I went to a couple of the concerts in the park last year that you had and I thought oh, that was great. Um, my question is, one of the points that you made was under the leadership of Becky Conrad, we we're working with the city to develop a protocol for creating a maintain. And I know that that was a discussion that was ha started about a year ago, I think the council started. When did we start? Wasn't for the that public right? art? Yeah. Yes, and we are looking at putting the policy on the April 4th meeting the, for to approve the policy to did, move forward. I was just wondering where we were in that. And yes. Because like, public art is extremely important. We get a lot of feedback from people. When we get a new piece of art or anything like that happens, the community loves it. So I just want to see this continue. So thank you. Okay. In that case, let me invite you all to the Art Walk um, on June 24th, uh, which we're going to be starting early with uh, dedications of the uh, two uh, sculptures, uh, one in Auburn and one in Lewiston, that we've um, set, installed in the last year, and then um, the dedication of the women's suffrage mural in Dufresne Plaza, um, which um, was a, a mystery photograph in the Sun Journal recently, and it will be a mystery no longer. Great. I've uh, known about that mural for a while, but I did not realize uh, that that was uh, commissioned by LA Art, so thank you. Um, it it um, actually commissioned by the National Endowment for the Arts. Okay. It's one of six in the entire nation, um, and the New England Foundation uh, for the Arts got one of those commissions, and uh, the Main Arts Commission put in for it, and they won the placement in, um, in Maine, 
and they decided to award it to Lewis and Auburn because we already have a working group on public art um, active, and that was because of the grant that, that we are administering. So it's, it's really um, a, a great case of where one thing plants the seeds for more, and you'll see public art just sprouting everywhere in Lewiston and in Auburn mm -hmm. um, these days, and we're working on, on some, and of course you know about that because you've been approving those projects. Jim, if you'd like to kind of put a plug in for your interactive website on your that describes the locations and stuff? Yes, thanks. Um, so if you go to <laughs> um, laarts.org, uh, you will find a, a map of public art sites. Um, and as you click on each one, it gives you a description of the work. And there are, are uh, guides to touring the public art works uh, in the cities either on foot or uh, by bicycle or by car. Um, and we will uh, be updating those as we add new works. Very nice. Further questions from the council? I don't know uh, anything else. I, no. I don't know if it's uh, too late or if anyone asks, but, uh, but I like Celtic music. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we, we uh, love to respond to requests from the city. Um, we, we got a call from Dottie last year um, saying that uh, could we help with uh, setting up the, the festival in Dufresne Plaza of, of, in December and, and we were happy to do that. Um, uh, we got a request several years ago now to help out with the planning of, of the um, arts wing of Lewiston High which we just it was such a moving moment to, to be there this afternoon mm -hmm. to see the opening of that. Um, so we, we um, are happy to contribute our expertise to, to projects um, that, that the city requests. And, and we'll, we'll look into the, the Celtic art. I, I can certainly have a uh, dotty follow-up with a, with a formal request. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, doctor. Have a wonderful evening. Thank no, you I just all. want to say thank you. Or, to, okay. or a further question? No, I was just going to say thank you. No. Thank you. So now um, it concludes my presentation tonight. I will shift it to Director Jeffers to talk about CDBG. Thank you, Administrator Hunter. Good evening. I have had Pauline Gudis join me. She is our longtime chair of the Citizen Advisory Committee of the CDBG Committee. Uh, we've got a lot of years together years. on this, so uh, she's added a lot to the discussion. We also have Paul Robinson, who is another committee member, and Councillor Jelanis, who uh, was her first year doing it. She added a lot to the discussion. Oh, and I, I didn't realize, but kind of glance back. So Abdi McGay is also here, another longtime uh, member. So uh, it's been a committee that has really done a lot of good work over the years. Uh, this year was especially challenging, and because we still don't really have numbers. Uh, the memo I sent out uh, sort of noted uh, that the first guidance we had was to plan on getting the same amount we got this year, which was 904000 and some change. And then when the Congress just passed their omnibus spending package, uh, they said it's a four and a half percent cut, which takes us down to an $865,000, $692 best guess estimate on how much money we have to allocate for various projects in the city. Uh, the number will change a little bit when HUD has the opportunity to actually run it through their formulas. There's a lot of metrics that go into that. If somebody had been added as another community, entitlement community, or uh, is, drops off the entitlement list, it'll change the numbers we get. So we're, we're kind of working with the best numbers we've got. Hopefully we'll have final numbers uh, before you take final action on this uh, in May. Um, another pot of money we get uh, is split with Auburn. That's our home consortium dollars. Those are dollars that historically we have primarily used to support the development of affordable housing projects. And that includes everything from uh, 
you know, just straight low income housing tax cut products to uh, mixed income projects like the one that's being built just up the road here on Pine Street, Gabbro Place, that has a mixture of market rate units and workforce housing. Uh, get started with this, our, our public process uh, started back in December. We put a request for proposals on the street that was due right at the end of the year. And uh, the committee that I, I referenced really d dives into this quickly. You, you need to read through all these applications. We had 13 applications come in. Uh, you read them, you interview the agencies, really get your questions asked. And there's really some uh, pretty specific uh, criteria that they're uh, evaluated on. And the committee each scores them independently. I get all the scores, consolidate them, come up with the average score. And if you look at the uh, PowerPoint um, or the uh, spreadsheet, it's, uh, it, it really gets into it. Let me, let me get a little bit into what CDBG is all about. Uh, this is, we are an entitlement community. We have been since 1974. As I just noted, it is based on what we get from Congress each year. It changes a little bit. There are three national objectives that need to be met. Uh, it's benefit low to moderate income people aid in the prevention or elimination of slums or blight, or the third is, is what's called the urgent need criteria. And it's actually a very high threshold. If you have a tornado come to down, your downtown is flooded and washed away, that's when you can use it. But typical things really are not. So it's really, it's the one that we've hung our hats on over the years is benefiting low and moderate income people through a variety of programs, as well as uh, really investing in our downtown public infrastructure that's it aiding in the prevention or elimination of slums and blight uh, we have a consolidated plan and that is a five-year planning document that again you engage citizenry you talk about it what's the needs how do we best use these money these monies that we receive uh, and it first goal of that is provide essential services to improve the quality of life for low to moderate income people including the homeless or people at risk of homelessness uh, we want to focus on number, goal number two, increase and maintain and improve supply of safe and affordable housing, again, for low to moderate income people. Third goal is create economic opportunities for those same residents, and that's either by lending money to businesses and creating low to moderate income jobs or investing in programs that educate them to allow them to uh, move into the workforce or improve their skill sets. And then uh, the last item, uh, the fourth goal is really the public infrastructure, and that's making those investments in streets and sidewalks and parks in our downtown target areas. Uh, this is the target area. Uh, there's four census tracts. All of these are, uh, are, are uh, at relatively low incomes, uh, high poverty rates, low education levels. And it's really the river all the way up to the area where Pineland Lumber, uh, that neighborhood, over to Russell Street, to East Avenue, and back to the river. So that's, that includes Little Canada, includes uh, the Tree Streets neighborhood, includes the area approaching Bates College, and the area behind Central Maine Medical Center. Uh, let me now go to the spreadsheet that uh, all the work of this committee uh, came to these recommendations. And as you said, right at the top of this is, uh, are the 13 agencies who applied. I did talk about the scoring criteria. Um, and it was tough sledding this year as I sat and listened to the committee talk. Every single agency that applied, uh, it was just striking the, the, the incredible work these, these agencies do in the community. Uh, we would have loved to have funded all of them. Uh, there's not enough money to fund all of them. And we have really had, uh, Guidance from HUD that we have been funding more agents and uh, agencies that we should. That, that, that temptation, like, God, you're all doing good work, let's give you some money. Uh, it's really come back where they said, you really are not adequately monitoring and making sure that all the regulations that you're bound by, all the agencies are also bound by. So HUD has given us the directive, you cannot fund more than six agencies. Um, so the, the uh, this year, there were actually five agencies that were funded. Trinity Jubilee has two programs. So it was those six programs that were got funded. And as the, there's another criteria uh, that's called the 15% agency cap. And uh, we're not allowed to give more than 15% of the allocation we receive each year, plus the prior year's program income, 15% of that. 
is the cap we can spend. Uh, it was $164,575 this year. Uh, when we actually added up the asks of those six agencies, those six programs that scored highest, uh, we were well below that cap. And it seemed not, you know, it's like, God, these agencies have real needs. They do good work in the community. Even though they only asked for this, that's because they were accustomed to competing with 13 other agencies and often nine or 10 or 11 of them would get funded, sometimes 12. So as the committee talked about it, how do we best use these dollars? Uh, they really said, look, we've, we've got a big homeless uh, issue going on. Uh, food costs are going up. People are struggling to feed their families. Let's really take those dollars and maximize what we can do. And they recommended uh, adding $10,000 to the ask of New Beginnings and Trinity Jubilee's Day Shelter. Uh, those are the folks that really provide direct services to either homeless youth or to the broader community at Trinity Jubilee. And then they had recommended adding $13,000 to the ask of the two agencies that provide uh, food assistance. So that was Meals on Wheels uh, through Seniors Plus and Trinity's Food Pantry. And so uh, you can see the numbers there of what is recommended. Uh, the total is $160,013, which is just a little bit below the cap that we're allowed to spend. And we really try to not bump right up against that cap, just in case there's some numbers that don't, don't work out quite as we expected to. You try to leave a bit of a gap, or about 2.8% below that gap. Uh, the other items that uh, are included in the budget was $188,265 for CDBG program administration, that's staff salaries, training, uh, copier supplies, those type things. Uh, there's a one code enforcement position, which is $83,977. That's the full package for a code enforcement person who is absolutely uh, committed and directed to the uh, CDBG target area. That's where all their work to they help with our other programs, with a lead program, other things that we need assistance on to really improve the quality of the housing stock. That's their job and they're, therefore they're eligible uh, to be funded under the program. Uh, we also have a rehabilitation prog program administration. That's our uh, residential and commercial loan programs. And that will also worked closely with our lead program. Again, trying to improve that, uh, the quality of the housing stock in the downtown or our downtown businesses when renovations are needed to the buildings. There's uh, $50,000 recommended for the lead grant. Uh, we've got a uh, lead program that provides 18,000 per unit to help uh, low to moderate income. Uh, I shouldn't say, they're not, the property owners aren't low to moderate income, but the tenants in the buildings are low to moderate income. We have a program that uh, provides 18,000 per unit to, uh, to renovate it and uh, the CDBG program provides $1,150 per unit of match to help make sure that those projects go forward. If it's a single family home, we provide $3,000 a match. Uh, a public works, public infrastructure project uh, is at Kennedy Park Sidewalks, which is, uh, is gonna be right outside here. It's on the Pine Street side as part of the choice planning grant. Uh, there was a lot of activity asking the residents of that neighborhood, how can we improve this? What sort of physical improvements do you want to see? After a lot of back and forth with HUD, uh, it was agreed that along the Pine Street side of the park, there will be new parks and, excuse me, new uh, tables and benches, place where you can play chess. There'll be new landscape and there'll be a public art. There'll be sort of a central piazza right off the Pine Street in the middle of the park. The one thing Choi said you can't use our money for is sidewalks because that's stuff that the city should pay for anyway. So that part of that, that side of HUD said you can't use the money, but CDB just says, yeah, that's sure, that's fine. So that way we'll be able to complete that project, do it right, do it well. Um, and then we had a hundred, the sort of the leftover money was $145,651. That last year was the first time we had tried to. We used it for, recommended it for public facilities, and that was for uh, agencies that, uh, rather than that one time they could apply for CDBG funds, let's say after that deadline, the roof went bad, or the furnace failed, or the pool uh, plumbing 
had major leaks or heat, whatever, whatever it might be, there are public facilities that needed improvement. So we had it allowed, they could apply throughout the year. Uh, we actually, this past year, provided new flooring at the YWCAA. We had some HVAC equipment that was put in to allow them to expand their programs. Uh, Tree Street Youth had troubles with their basement, which was full of accumulated debris from many, many, many years prior tenants. We cleaned it out, dried up the basement, have a drainage system. We talked last week about that program, just sort of finishing it up. So we're recommending that $145,600 plus dollars be dedicated to that. This year we would also say instead of just public facilities that we also allow that to be used for public infrastructure projects in that targeted downtown area where if there's a cost overrun or something comes up suddenly that needs attention, we've got a pot of money we can go to. And all those we would come back to the council. It's, so it's not like we can just willy-nilly spend that money. We'd be coming back to you to get approval for it, but we thought we should set aside. That money, um, I do have uh, Betsy Sawyer Manter is here in the audience. She runs uh, Seniors Plus and uh, Aaron Reed with Trinity Jubilee Centers and the Food Pantry is here. Um, so if you've got questions or, or would like to hear from them, but I can keep going, but I'll pause at this point on the CDBG budget and sort of open it up for, for questions. Councilor Scott. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to advocate for my ward which is it uh, there is a track which is track what is it 202 and I would just like to advocate that when we're looking at using and allocating some of these funds that there are some significant needs for infrastructure and sidewalks and there are a lot of people that that use that river walk and go down into that neighborhood and there's some serious concerns with pedestrian safety down there the roads and also, I would also like to advocate for, at some point, some, just looking at that whole track. I, I personally, in a lot of years at looking at this, a lot of money is spent, not that it's not needed, please don't misunderstand me, in the downtown area, but that is considered one of our census tracks and it does not see a lot of funding and I'd like to see some more focus on that area. And that's me advocating for my neighbors, thank you. You're welcome, and, and point well made. Uh, it's, it is an issue that has been heard. I, I was hopeful we'd be able to move some money there this year. In talking with Public Works, there are some uh, stormwater separation projects going on. Uh, so it, I, I'm glad to say it's sort of planned and in the budget for next year. We just weren't able to do it this year. And so stay tuned. I will. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you'll hold me to it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> 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 Councillor Inchalanis, followed by Councillor uh, LaChapelle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, like you mentioned, Director Jeffers, I had the opportunity under your direction and Pauline Gudis to participate for the first time in this process, and I just want to say um, it, there's so much diligence put into this process. Um, you know, the public services scoring criteria that is used uh, is remarkable in direct response to the consolidated plan all 13 agencies that we heard doing such valuable work and what struck me the most was the uh, the amount of work being done with a limited amount of dollars uh, being requested I mean that I, I it just blows you away and uh, so you know certainly the guidelines put forth from HUD um, you know saying just six programs um, limited our choices for sure and we really came at it from a heart give needs point of view, really looking at shelter, looking at food, um, some of those things. So um, it was a tough, tough decision because, um, like you mentioned, Director Jeffers, I mean, there's a lot of agencies doing incredible work in our community. Um, but I just, I want to commend the process. Um, being new to this, I, you know, I, I think I labored it a bit with all my questions. <laughs> Uh, but it was really a, <laughs> a pleasure to be a part of, and I just really wanted to share my experience with my fellow councilors. Thank you. Councilor LaChapelle. Thank you. Um, great job. Great job. Um, as a foreign chair that held your position back in the 80s, uh, <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, did um, I appreciate what, you, uh, what you're going through. Um, question for Director. Um, I see on the next page, and I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, that the source of funds, 
I see the 885 and the carryover of 451 and the reallocation of the RLF to program income. And we're seeing a total of 2 million 17. Yes, and I, I, I paused here, but I will be taking that up, sort of our recommendation on allocations. If, if so, if, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for your okay. question, but I, I well, do have an saying, answer to what I think Are we only it. spending 800000 when we have $2 million sitting there? We've got plans to spend the rest of that, and that is the next You're going to enlighten us with those plans. I, in I am, and I should also note, I got late-breaking news that we've had a lot of staff turnover, so that's $700,000 worth of uh, program income. Uh, we're not, we, may, we may not have that much that we can reallocate. Uh, so that, that's a continuing conversation. There's, it's program income, which out of commercial, um, it, it's basically all the loans we've put out over the last 20 years. As those payments come back in, that's called program income. It's been under a revolving loan fund, and under the rules of the revolving loan fund, uh, money that comes back in can only go back out as loans, either for residential or commercial projects. We'd had a, we have had less demand for those programs in recent years, especially because of the amount of federal money that's been coming into the cities in the area. And if a business owner has a chance to take a loan or get a grant, they're taking the grant. So that those monies ha have accumulated. And uh, the issue I was just about to jump into is the spend down, and we, we need to draw those monies down. We don't need them sitting around. So we do need to repurpose them, and that's part of the conversation for tonight. Okay. My second question might be for the administrator. Um, I'm looking, just going through these budgets, I see um, administrator or director covered in this for that, for that the tune of, what is it, uh, 160 administrator and planning, $188,000, CD office administrator. And we're going down on all these other administrators on the third floor. Is that floor pretty much budget neutral? So I look at the fees that are coming in from uh, construction. I look at this. Is, th is that entire floor not affecting the bottom line of the budget? Um, we do not allocate revenues as such on the general fund. It's, they're not dedicated to that department. But if you look at it from that perspective, it's got to be real close. I think it's going to be highly dependent on what projects and what permits are pulled in any given year on whether they're truly budget neutral or not. As we're seeing right now, they have a code yep. enforcement officer just dedicated to that. Um, and I'm looking, pardon? The area. Yes, just for that area. And then we just look at the other code enforcement officers that are up there. You have three or two? There's two building, two building inspectors and two code and well, code and a sanitarian, okay. independent of the one that's on CD. I, I, I guess I'm just confused because I'm I'm looking at the monies coming in and the allocation towards them. Um, it looks like it's a budget neutral department. That if we continue to grow, we get more money. We can hire more code enforcement officers. Yeah, I should caution that. Uh, HUD sort of frowns upon using community development black grant dollars for projects that they think cities should pay for in themselves. Case in point with the sidewalk. We used to pay, we allocated a fire truck at one point out of that. Right, and it, it's sort of a one-time thing. And it, to say, okay, we're gonna pay for our code enforcement entirely with CDBG, well, H no, HUD would not allow it. But if you needed more, like the lead grant program is of absolutely, as a past landlord, it was a great tool to have and it was very helpful um, to have that program involved uh, so I'm, I'm just okay I yeah. guess I'll answer you've answered my questions and I'll hold off the rest of my questions for okay. this page coming up okay yeah no and there, we do have a lead program it's got its own program manager and it helps fund several positions at this point uh, please proceed with the rest of the presentation okay um, and uh, Council of La Chapelle, uh, your timing was very good. Uh, let, me, let me pull this sheet down, open up the next, which, which kind of grabs those numbers. Uh, this was discussed with the City Citizen Advisory Committee as well. It's the reallocation of contingency that has grown 
And uh, there's $461,601 that has grown over the last four or five years where things that were budgeted actually didn't get done. The public works project may have not gone forward or some of the agencies, um, during, especially during COVID, some of the uh, agencies received funding, but they were not able to all, draw it all down. So for a variety of reasons, we have $451,600 or so dollars uh, that is available to be reallocated at this point. Uh, the portion I'm less confident on at the moment, uh, just the size of that revolving loan fund was larger than I thought. We were not looking to take all of it. We were looking to take a portion of it. Uh, so over the, between now and uh, when we're back to you in April, excuse me, in May, um, that number will be adjusted. But the way we thought would be best used, uh, that one point, nearly $1.2 million was uh, down in the Little Canada neighborhood, the River and Oxford Street sidewalks and roads down in that area. Streets are very narrow. Uh, the roads are in terrible condition. The sidewalks are in terrible condition. The sidewalk, the uh, Curbs are not really separating it. There's not much parking. Potvin Park could use some love. Uh, so for all those reasons, there was a $608,000 um, public works project planned for that area. Uh, up in the Tree Streets area, it would really be completing uh, Howe and Birch uh, sidewalks. Uh, Sabata Street to Howe, and I think it's, uh, I'm trying to think what the, yeah, on House Street, it was Sabatis to Walnut Street, and on Birch Street, it was Howe to Bartlett Street. Uh, it was the way we thought we'd spend, uh, it would be the recommendation for spending the money. Uh, the Promise uh, Early Childhood Center is, is redeveloping the former Lewiston Housing Authority building at One College Street. Uh, they are really needing some money for equipment, uh, playground equipment, and uh, a shade structure. So there was $100,000 was the rest there, and Democracy Brewing is redoing the St. Joseph's Church. And uh, that'll result in low income, low to moderate income job creation, as well as sort of saving a historic structure, which is an eligible CDBG use. And it's not quite bladed yet, but it's certainly on its way. So for all those reasons, that was uh, it. So if you take all four of those and that original $1.19 million dollars of, uh, of, of money to be reallocated, we had about $37,500 left over. That number may shift the exact programs, but I think that speaks to your issue, Councilor LaChapelle. I had that spent already. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I should know, I mean, this, these are the recommendations of the Citizen Advisory Committee. Uh, ultimately, it's the Council's decision on how these dollars spent, are spent. I think the public works projects, there probably is a higher degree of flexibility, I would say, certainly with the agencies. There's an enormous amount of work that goes into determining how those monies are best spent. So I, if you, if you want to sort of play with allocations, I would, my own personal plea is that we sort of stay away from the agencies. And if you want to spend other allocations, I think that would be the way I would ask that you uh, consider any changes you want to make. Questions from the council? Councillor Pease. Well, I want to commend the uh, six that were chosen for all the work they do. Um, my question is, they requested X amount of dollars. Is that like a limit or they can, could they ask for more? The agencies? Yes. Yeah, no, there is no limit. Uh, they all have been pretty consistent in their asks over the years, and this year really was, to a degree, sort of upset the apple cart because people sort of were respectful, even uh, actually Trinity, who does I mean, a bunch of work with very little money they get, said, look, we got real need, but we don't want to ask for more because we have great respect and admiration for the work everybody else does. So there, there is a sort of this common sense if we're all in this together, let's do the best we can with the limited dollars we have. And so this year was really a, 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 the fact we had to cut in half the number of agencies we fund. Uh, well, so. that's the only reason I ask that is because I, I don't think they get anywhere near enough for all of what they do. And I just hope if there was any way we could increase it. Yeah, actually, it looks like you want to say something. We, we can only allocate so much, uh, as Lincoln said, 15%. So we're at the threshold of we can't allocate anymore. 
that's you know, if we had more money, we could, but we, we're not allowed to. So. Okay, thank you. I wish we could, though. Yeah, yeah, no, and I'm and I misunderstood. I thought you were talking about the agencies themselves are not limited. The amount we can give to the agencies is, though. Yes, misunderstood. So. Councilor La Chapelle. Thank you for your indulgence. I keep on asking questions. Would somebody enlighten me about the promise shade structure and equipment on College Street? The, I, I know, but what is the, who is it? Uh, promise is the Head Start program. They rebranded. They, okay. So it's Head Start and it's, it's playground equipment and, and some sort of shade structure to keep the kids out of the sun. Where were they located before? Was it an extra Trinity yeah, Jubilee? Yeah, I think there, there is a Coburn School, former Coburn School. Oh, yeah. Okay, the Trinity. And do they own that building, or is that? The, the city owns it. city owns it. Okay. I, I remember giving them money back in the 80s on that oh. occasion. So <laughs> I, I just wasn't familiar with the, with the name on it. Thank you. Further questions? Anything you'd like to add, Pauline? No, uh, just I hope that you go by our recommendations. I mean, these programs are really on a shoestring. We we really, last year we did, what, nine? nine agencies. Last year, I think it was nine agencies. And HUD is basically, you know, they give you the money and they tell you this is a number. And all the agencies were deserving. And we, we had some money that we gave more money to a couple agencies actually four programs and the four programs that we gave added money above what their ask was was basically because they're providing food um, to people and not just homeless people um, and if, if you asked Erin Erin would tell you that she has working families coming in um, to the pantry to get food because the dollar is just not going where it needs to go Prices of food have shot up, and even running their food program, uh, their meals at noontime, the costs have skyrocketed. And that's why um, the board, uh, the, the committee decided that the agencies that were feeding people would get extra money. So it's not just, I, I want to make sure, it's not just homeless people that are going to Trinity. It's a lot of people who are working. And between gas and heating fuel, um, food, they're just not making ends meet. So it's providing a, a very necessary program. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for chairing the committee and it, thank you all of the committee it, members. It, or, are I, we, I've, got, I've got one more budget oh, to I'm touch sorry, upon. I'm please just proceed. sort of scanning for questions. I wasn't sure. Okay, we'll get with, we'll get with the program. Please proceed, Director okay, Jeffers. Okay, last one. This is the HOME program. Uh, again, this is a consortium. Lewis and Auburn uh, shared this pot of money individually. The cities are not large enough to collect, to, get, to attract these dollars. Uh, again, HUD said, plan on getting the same amount you got last year. That may change. But uh, we are expecting to get $469,750. Since Auburn has the primary responsibility for the administrative burden, they get 7% of the 10%. It's allowed for administration. We get 3%, which adds up to $14,093 for the administrative costs. We have $211, $387 for programs uh, that when we combine with carry forwards and unspent money from prior years, we have $801, $171 available to be spent. Uh, we're recommending 15,000 be carried forward for security deposits as some of the federal dollars start drying up. Uh, right now, the main housing has the program where uh, they'll, they'll pay your rent, they'll pay your uh, utilities and whatnot if you're not able to pay it for yourself. But we'll, as that pot of money starts drying up, we'll have homeless folks or near homeless folks who are trying to get into the next property. That's what that $15,000 helps pay are the security deposits. Um, we have uh, Gavro Place uh, is well underway at this point. We still have $126,720 that uh, needs to go into that project to complete it from monies we've already committed. And uh, as part of our choice plan, uh, we have the Raise Up Housing Project, which ended up using state money, home money, instead of our home money, just because the state was able to be more responsive on the time frame they needed it. So we're recommending that the money that had been allocated for the raise up 
uh, which is going to be breaking ground uh, next month. So glad to see that project going, but that freed up some money that we, we can use for choice neighborhood projects. We had committed $600,000 worth of uh, home dollars to help make some of those projects happen. They help leverage other dollars, low-income housing tax credits being the primary funding source. So the committee is recommending $448,052 for uh, choice projects yet to be determined and uh, another 112,639 for low other low income housing tax credit projects. Um, there's been a lot of discussion already with the uh, homeless shelter that's been proposed, which is a $1.7 million of which Lewiston gets 722,000. More or less uh, is what we expect. We are in the midst of that process. Uh, it's not just about that. There are four areas you can use it for uh, to develop new housing, like the rest of the housing, as long as it's helping uh, homeless or near homeless people. You can use it for a con uh, non-congregate shelter. Um, you can use it for uh, supportive services. So maybe going out, working in the homeless camps and whatnot. So we're, we're in the process, Jessica. Wilson, who's on my staff, is really having the conversation she needs to have with back to the council with a plan on how we recommend that planning, and that's a much broader discussion. But that's everything that's going on. So the next steps is, uh, is, is public comment. We've uh, posted all this, that we uh, have started this process uh, April 1. There will be public notice uh, on the city's webpage with all these memos, as well as an action plan, which sort of fleshes out the details on what you got tonight. Uh, we'll be taking public comment for 30 days, and uh, that'll start on April 1st, run through May 2nd, and then on May 3rd, we'll be back to you for uh, finalizing all this. And uh, uh, Anything else? Yeah, at this point, I will say I am done, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, up for any questions that there may be. Dr. Pease? Or uh, counselor piece. Wow, you just get elevated. <laughs> yeah, today. just got a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> On the uh, Choice Neighborhood Project of uh, $448,000, is that, it, is that the old funeral home redevelopment and all that on Pine Street here? It's on Pine Street and in the Choice Program. It's what's known as Site 2, and it's the Wedgwood um, Okay, that's the yes, same. That's okay. the, that's I, a I've, heard, I've heard a variety of names. Hey, that, yeah, that, that was a new one. funeral name. home. <laughs> yes. Um, is any of that money that they're asking for there uh, part of the lead program that we got going on? Because I'm sure there's lead in that building. And I'm just wondering about if that cost can be absorbed in some of that. That is a good question. Uh, I'm not sure. Our, it, it, it's something worth exploring. Uh, the question has not arisen yet. Um, lead programs, I you can't really use it for creating new housing. It's for it, new, if there's already housing there, I don't think we'll be able to use it because we asked that question with another mill that was being redeveloped and that was more commercial to a residential use and I suspect that there was some residential there. It, it's a good question, I'm not sure the answer to. I wish we could check exploring. it out and find yeah, out. No, no, if we, could, if we can get some of that money in there, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Further questions from the council? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director. Thank, thank you, Pauline, for chairing, and thank you to all the committee members here. Thank you all. Administrator Hunter, does that uh, conclude this evening? Yes, it does. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you.